grace to you and peace from God our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ. Amen. What are you doing with all the clutter in your life? And you, you all know what I'm talking about. All that stuff that just clutters up around us. You know, what do we do with it? That stuff in the basement. That stuff in the crawl spaces, in the attic. You know, the things you have over at the storage building. You forgot you had a storage building, didn't you, right? You even forget about it. There's so much stuff. It's just everywhere. How do we declutter? You know, if you uh, go to the uh, cable or, or satellite networks, you'll find a couple of networks called HGTV and uh, DYI. And if you look at those, sometimes they have programs on there that specialize in helping you to declutter help you to kind of organize the house, get rid of the things that ought to be gotten rid of. And uh, if you ever watch, if you ever watch Then Home and Garden or you watch a Do-It-Yourself Network, you will see that they have these segments and they really do help people. They really do help people. I remember one episode where uh, this, uh, fam this family invited them in, you know, to kind of help them declutter and organize. And so they walked into a room and uh, now in your house, obviously, if you walk into certain rooms, you'd know what that room is. But these people walked into this room in this house from the entrance of the home, and they had to ask what room it was. And the woman said, well, it's the den. And they said, this is the den? And they said, yes. Well, over in one corner was a sectional sofa from the 60s. And uh, over in the other corner were exercise equipment. And then over in another corner was a television set, but they had all these boxes stacked next to it and books and, and newspapers. And then there was a bean bag in the middle. And they said, oh, this is the den, huh? <laughs> That's the den. So they get down and they start saying, well, we need to clean out the den. So they go into one of this big closet, there's a big closet in the, in the master bedroom, big closet, big walk-in closet, but you can't walk in for all the clutter that's in it. And so finally they've got the, and finally they find this old pair of football shoes. Old, old pair of football shoes. They look terrible, moldy and everything. And so the, the guy says to the woman, says, Well, what are these? And she said, Oh, uh, those are my husband's. Uh, those were the shoes he was wearing when he made his first touchdown in middle school. And the guy says, Your husband's still in middle school? And she said, well, no, no, well, I think it's time we get rid of what's in middle school. You know? And so, clutter, 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 clutter. It's amazing what builds up in our lives with regard to clutter that is around us. And what about the kind of clutter that, that you're living with? Just as uh, there can be clutter in our physical environment, friends, there can also be clutter in our mental and spiritual environment, too. We can clutter up our lives with things, mentally, spiritually, as well. And uh, we do that through the things that we uh, consume by the way of popular media or other things like that. We begin to clutter our lives up with things. And, and suddenly the noise of the world becomes the main thing we live with, it seems like, all the time. And so St. Paul, I think here in, in Romans 12 in particular, uh, gives us kind of a formula right there in the first couple of verses. He's giving us a formula for living differently in the world, of living decluttered lives so that we are freed up to live a different way in this noisy world of ours. One of the things that these families have uh, who have called in the experts from these uh, networks to declutter what is required of them, and it's kind of funny to watch sometimes, is they have to sacrifice something. They have to sacrifice something. In this one episode, they said, now what we're going to do is we're going to help you declutter, and we're going to take it all out to your lawn, and we're going to have a, a, a yard sale, and all your neighbors are going to be able to come, and you're going to start by decluttering with this big yard sale. Okay? So the woman's out there, and these people are coming, and, uh, of course, the cameras are doing it. And every once in a while, the cameras would catch her taking something and putting it back in the garage. Or someone would come up and want to buy something, and she says, well, I'm not really selling that today. No, sacrifice. Decluttering requires sacrifice. You have to say goodbye to some things. You have to put some things away. 
You have to give them away or dispose of them out of your life. It's that way with our spiritual clutter too. And that is why Paul begins here by saying we're supposed to be living sacrifices. There is sacrifice involved in decluttering our lives, spiritually as well as physically. So let's look at Romans chapter 12, and here in this first verse. And I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to really parse this first verse and the second. And you can see it there in your outline the way I've done that. But let's talk about that first thing. He says to them, I appeal to you therefore. Well, what is the therefore? What is the therefore? Well, the therefore is the conclusion of chapter 11 that was read in our epistle today. But the therefore is everything that he has said to these Romans from chapter 1 all the way to this point in chapter 12. And what has he talked about? He's talked about the gospel. The gospel, which it has the power of salvation for everyone who will hear it. What has he talked about? He's talked about putting away sin. He's talked about repentance. He's talked about faith and how faith comes not from doing things or following the law, but because of God's great grace in Jesus Christ. And everyone has fallen short of the glory of God and is in need of God's grace. And by the gospel has been said all these things that he said and how God has not abandoned his people and how God will bring his people into faith. The children of Abraham uh, by lineage as well as the children of Abraham by faith. That's all the things he's talked about. Now, finally in 12, he says, Therefore, since all these things are true, things that we've talked about here in various messages over the last few weeks, since those things are all true, I appeal to you, brothers and sisters, I appeal to you now. Listen very carefully. And I appeal to you not on my own. I don't appeal to you on my own. I appeal to you on the mercies of God. On the mercies of God. And that's an interesting phrase there. Mercies of God. It's really about the grace of God. God's mercy is grace. And on the grace of God, he is not talking about law here. Paul is not talking here about something that you've got to do to be saved. He's not talking about something that you absolutely must do to get right with God. He's not saying that you are saved by getting your act together. So get your act together and then God will save you. No, that's not what he's saying. He's talking about grace. It is by faith, it is by the free gift of God's grace which was worked through Jesus Christ that motivates us to rid our life of the clutter. It motivates us to rid our life of sin. It motivates us to fix our eyes on Jesus, the author and perfecter of our faith. When Jesus gets our attention, our full attention, when we have allowed ourselves to declutter and defragment our lives from the world and we put our focus on Jesus, then what happens? We begin to listen to Him. We start tossing out the clutter that interferes with living out our faith because we're listening to Him and we're focusing on Him. And that's what He's saying. I appeal to you by the mercies of God. By the mercy of God which were demonstrated in Jesus Christ, which He has told them about all through those previous chapters in the letter. Just as people who call in the decluttering experts and pros and pay attention to them and begin to get some control in their life, so also we get sanity and sanctity in our life by decluttering it from the things that would interfere with the grace, mercy, and love of Christ in our lives. He goes on in the text and says, to present yourselves. So I appeal to you, therefore, brothers, by the mercies of God, to present yourselves... Your bodies in particular, he starts here with the bodies, your bodies as living sacrifices. And here we, he finally gets to it. We are to be living sacrifices. What does that mean? You know, a sacrifice is always about giving up something. A sacrifice is giving up something. You really can't have your cake and eat it too. You can't. It's not possible. How many people's lives have run to destruction because they thought they could. They really thought they could have it all. It could all be theirs. And somehow even take it with them. No. As, a, as the old saying goes, there are no U-Hauls behind hearses. You can't take any of it with you. You know. It's like the grave diggers who were standing beside the grave they had just digged back in the old days. And this very, very wealthy man was being buried in his gold Cadillac. 
And so they were slowly letting this gold Cadillac down in this huge grave that these guys had dug. And they're both leaning on their shoulders. And one side, the guy says to the other, is this gold Cadillac with this man in it. It goes down in the grave. He says to his grave digging buddy, now that's living. <laughs> no, it's not. You can't take any of it with you. Sacrifice should be living sacrifice. Sacrifice involves giving up. It involves giving away something. It involves the uh, setting something aside in order to make room for the better, the new, the more important, the perfect. There's no room for that if your life is cluttered up. And so he says you've got to be living sacrifices. When my body is being controlled or directed by a cluttered spirit, a cluttered mind, then I have a hard time completely turning over to the Lord what is His and what has been claimed as His by the saving work of Jesus Christ. God is to have all of me. Not just the parts I want to give Him, but all of me. There was a Christian writer one time who wrote a nice little essay. And basically in the essay, uh, he is going to get right with God in the essay. So he's going to get right with Jesus. So he invites Jesus into his house. And so he uses the house, kind of his house, which is all cluttered up, of course. He uses his house then as, as the example of how we declutter our lives. Okay? And so it all sounds like work. It really does. Uh, until you get to the end of the essay. So he invites Jesus into the den. Well, there's a lot of stuff in the den that's not nice. You know, he's cluttered himself up with pornographic magazines. He's cluttered himself up with uh, wrong kind of stuff on TV and all this. And so Jesus comes in and cleans up the den. And then the bedroom he cleans up, and then he cleans up the kitchen, what he eats and what he drinks and that sort of thing. And then he cleans up the garage. And, he, and, and, and Jesus cleans up all the parts. And every day he spends time with Jesus helping him clean up. Helping him clean up. And then Jesus is in the nice cleaned up den and uh, this guy gets up and pays no attention to Jesus. He kind of just leaves, kind of just leaves. And finally, Jesus, he gets up one morning and has nothing, you know, he sees Jesus in the den, but just passes by, and Jesus says, hey, hold it a minute. And then says, what? He says, you know, there's a terrible smell coming from the hall closet. closet. And, the, and the man says, ooh, I thought he wouldn't notice that. I thought he wouldn't notice that. And so, you don't want to go in there, Jesus. That's not a place you want to go. He said, no, I'm, I've come here to clean up everything. Well, I, that closet is really kind of my, my thing. You, you really don't need to get involved in that. He said, no, I need to see it all. And so finally, he finally then surrenders, which is what we all have to do, so that Jesus gets it all and gets it all cleaned up. And then finally, what does the man do? What does he do? Once that horrible little secret place got cleaned out of all its clarity and the perfection of the Christian life and of sanctity in Christ was going to be how he wanted to live, he went to the drawer, the locked drawer in his bedroom and got out the deed of the house and gave it to Jesus. We have to turn the deed of our life over to Him. That's the level of sacrifice that living sacrifices have to make is to turn the deed of our life completely over to Jesus Christ. And why are they called living sacrifices? Why does He see? Because it is one that goes on and on. It's the one that is lived out from now through all eternity. We don't have to have a dying sacrifice. Jesus already took care of the dying part for us. We don't have to have that part. He did that part. We are now to be the living sacrifices in Him. We are to live out our lives in service of love in self-denial. Look at what the apostles gave up. Look at what the apostles gave up. They gave up successful businesses. They gave up their families. They gave up their houses to follow this man around for three years wherever he went. Wherever he went. And finally, Peter speaks up one day in Mark chapter 10 and asks, Lord, look, we've given up everything for you. What are we going to get? What, are, what do we get for that? And Jesus turned to him and he says, 
Everyone who has given up, and he lists all the things, family and job and, and home and, and, and position and all this stuff, will receive a hundred times more in the kingdom that will come. Now, a hundred times more simply is saying an infinite amount of more than what you think you could ever gain on yourself here. Living sacrifices. And if that living sacrifice is, is in the name of Jesus Christ and according to His call on your life, there is no ending to what can be and will be yours. So how are we living sacrifices then? How are we as living sacrifices to be in this world that we live in? What he goes on. He goes on and says, this is going to be uh, holy and acceptable to God. You're going to be living sacrifices which are holy, H-O-L-Y, and acceptable to God, the text says. That is a holy mind and a holy spirit. That is a justified, sanctified person by God through the work of Jesus Christ. This kind this kind of holy act, a person is exactly the kind of person that wants to make sure they're living a sanctified life so that their temple can be indwelt by God. Just as the man wanted God to have the deed to his house, Christ would be in his life, so we want to turn it all over to him. We want to sacrifice everything for him because we want our bodies to become the temples of the Holy Spirit. How do you begin? I appeal to you, brothers, by the mercy of Christ, off your bodies as living sacrifices, holy and acceptable to God. Holy and acceptable. Why? Because I want this body to be a temple. And I want it to be the temple of God. In 1 Corinthians 6, St. Paul wrote this. Or do you not know that your body is a temple? The temple of the Holy Spirit within you, whom you have from God. You are not your own. You are bought by a price. So glorify God in the body. Glorify God in the body. And then earlier, St. Paul had said to the Corinthians in Corinthians 3.17, For God's temple is holy, and you are that temple. You are that temple. And so he's telling them to be holy and acceptable to God. And, and what is holy is acceptable to God. And what is that? He says it's your spiritual worship. It's your spiritual worship. In other words, if I'm totally acceptable to God, my, my worship, which is a physical worship, we come to a physical place. You know? And we, we sing songs with a physical voice. We listen to His Word with physical ears. Okay? So we are to worship Him spiritually through the bodies, through our bodies. When our bodies are distracted by the world, when they're distracted by the clutter, when they're distracted by all of the things that we bring along with us, all the baggage we've not turned over to the Lord, all those little closets that are smelling up in our lives that we've not allowed Him into, then are we really freed up then for spiritual worship? We are when we have allowed Him to redeem all of that. The word here for spiritual worship is a very interesting word. I have it there for your te uh, in text. What is translated spiritual is really the word uh, logikain. And uh, uh, we get the word logic from it or, or uh, things that have to do with reasoning. It, it, mean, it pertains to speech or reasoning or it pertains to uh, the spiritual insofar as it talks about the soul. The soul has logic in the sense that it's spiritual. Uh, it also has to do with what is agreeable and reasonable. So sometimes you will find spiritual worship will be translated in your Bible as reasonable service. Now the word for worship here is the, uh, is the uh, Greek word latria, which uh, means worship, but also means service. What does he mean by this? What is your reasonable worship then? What is your reasonable worship? Well, this is your reasonable worship. And why is it? This, this way you live your life, this holiness, this, this uh, 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 ability of, of understanding yourself as a living sacrifice. This is, in fact, your worship. Your life as a living sacrifice for the sake of Christ. That is your reasonable worship. Because you have become a rational person. You have come to the logical conclusion 
that the best place to be in your life is in this special relationship with God through Jesus Christ. This is a reasonable place for you to be. This is rational for you to accept this free gift of, of faith and this free gift of grace from God. And you have. So in fact, reasonable worship is the same as your spiritual worship. You have reasoned to this. You have reasoned, at least I hope you have. Paul says be renewed in your mind. I hope you have reasoned to this. I hope that you don't just come here because this is what you do every Sunday, kind of like your life is so regimented. Hold it, Sunday, I've got to be in church. I hope it's more than that. I think I hope you have reasoned to this point in your life that it is reasonable for me to offer this worship, this spiritual worship. It comes from that part of my renewed mind which has been transformed by the Holy Spirit, by the work of Jesus, and His promise that allows me to serve Him totally and completely. Totally and completely with my whole being. So there's no part of me that will not serve Him. My mind will be engaged in worship. My body will be functioning in worship. I am totally engaged with the Lord. For you are a living sacrifice, holy and acceptable to God. Therefore, worship goes everywhere you go. Here we get to celebrate it in a special way, but the worship goes wherever you go. You're a temple of the Holy Spirit. You can praise God anywhere. You can give God the glory anywhere. It doesn't matter. I remember saying something, uh, uh, so, uh, I remember saying, uh, uh, have a blessed day to somebody, and the person responded, let the glory be to God. See, you worship, we just worshiped. We just had a little worship time there. You worship anywhere. Because you carry in you the Holy Spirit of God, which you got from God through Christ. So St. Paul then does this in the second verse. Do not therefore be conformed to the world. How can we possibly now go back and be conformed to the world? How can we start thinking like the world? How can we start living like the world? How is that possible if we are wholly acceptable to God and our living sacrifices unto Him? Totally accepted by Him, which is our spiritual worship. How can I live any other way except by Him? How do people of this world act? How, how do they conduct themselves in the world? What do people of this world use their bodies for? Do they not use their bodies for their advantage? Do they not use their bodies in order they may get what they want? You know, the body is can be a taskmaster. Can be a taskmaster. I knew a teacher back when I was a when I was a teacher. It did not matter. It did not matter what the weather was like. It could be below zero, and he would still run six miles a day. It could be pouring down rain. There could be tornado warnings. He would run six miles a day. He was completely in love with his body in the sense of keeping it healthy, strong, healthy as it possibly could be. Before he was 60, he died. Before he was 60. Because he thought because he was doing all that with his body, he could put anything in his body he wanted to. Didn't matter what he ate. He never gained weight. He didn't see all the little plaque going on in his blood system. But he didn't gain any weight because he was running six miles a day. Every day, seven days a week, for years, for decades, for decades. People fall in love with their bodies for all kinds of different reasons, to get what they think they can get from it. We cannot be conformed to the behavior of the world, even if it looks good. We don't conform ourselves to it. We have to be transformed, and that's exactly what he says in the next verse, next part of the verse. We have to be transformed by the renewal of our minds. And the renewal of the mind there is always about putting in the mind that which is new. It's getting rid of the old, the sacrifice part, and putting in what is new. The Greek word here for transform is a word which is akin to metamorphosis. And that means being changed into something that's quite different than what it was before. Our minds, which are transformed by the Holy Spirit, are to be quite different than the minds of those in the world. We have a completely different view of the world. And it's very difficult for those in the world who have very materialistic or scientific minds to understand it. And that is why we say gift is that faith is a gift. Because it is very difficult to understand if you are so taken up with the clutter of the world. To understanding how one's mind can be renewed in the Holy Spirit. It is a it, it, it's a time for us to, to, to come out of our shell as a person, uh, uh, kind of surrounded by the clutter of this world, and be filled 
with the, uh, 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 with the energy of the Holy Spirit to do away with egocentrism and put our center on Christ and God and be completely transformed, recreated by Christ. I love the example of the butterfly. You know, often the butterfly is used as an example of resurrection. It's also uh, used as an example of renewal, of change, and that sort of thing. It's a great example of the world's mind as opposed to the transformed mind, right? I think the butterfly is fantastic. What is a butterfly? What, what's the life cycle of a butterfly? Well, those of you who have you know, studied your you know, life science in school, you know the life cycle of the butterfly. And the butterfly starts out, of course, as an egg that has been planted on some little tree someplace, and, uh, or a limb or a leaf or something, and, uh, and then uh, 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 hatches into a little pupa, and then that becomes what? A caterpillar, the larva, the caterpillar. What is the life of a caterpillar? Eat, eat, don't be eaten, eat, <laughs> you know, eat. That's the, isn't that life? Isn't that the life of the people who have just a material mind? Consume, consume, consume. Don't get consumed, but consume until they are consumed, right? The caterpillar is a great little example. All you eat. Finally, one day, by the grace of God, the little caterpillar in his little pea brain, well, I don't know what kind of brain they have, that little caterpillar said, Whew, am I through with this world? Man, I'm finished with all this. This eating's killing me. I just I can't eat another bite. Can you eat another? I can't eat another bite. Man, you know, I feel like I want to go over there and hang on that tree or something. I, I just, you know, I can't stand it. And finally the little caterpillar goes and he cocoons. Chrysalis. You know, he becomes this little thing hanging on a tree. You know, this little funny thing. And if you were to tear that open, if you were to tear that open before time, you would kill him, of course, because he's this little hard shell thing inside. Completely transformed. But finally one day, what happens? One day it breaks open. The wings are spread. He sits there and he sits there for a while and flutters up and is completely transformed. What becomes his job then? What becomes the butterfly's job then? The butterfly's job then is, to, is self sacrifice. To sacrifice themselves to make other little caterpillars. <laughs> and to go from tree to tree and bush to bush in order to what? Enhance nature. They become a part of something that totally enhances nature. They totally now are outward directed in, in that sense. Even their flying allows them to go so many different places. They've been set free from this consumption attitude to do so many wonderful things. So many wonderful things. Our missionaries who now live on station in, uh, in Chirala, India, uh, they, they, they were here in America. They had nice home, cars, uh, great retirements from, their, from the, where they worked, all these, things, all these things. And they could have continued to consume and consume and consume. But the Lord led them rather to go to India, live in a rather humble, humble circumstance, and use everything they had, everything they had accumulated all through the years. They sold it all. They even got to sell their house now. They're selling everything so that they can give it to the poor. They become butterflies. Completely butterflies into the world. This is a great illustration of this transformation that Paul taught may be transformed in the renewal of your minds, thinking differently. And this transformation is demonstrated by renewal. And the renewal of our lives, really. Uh, why do some people reject, reject God and, and view the practice of worship as childish and and as a complete waste of time. Why do some people see that? It's because their minds are fleshly, to use a Pauline term. They have these fleshly minds. Their minds have not yet been renewed by the power of the Holy Spirit. When Dr. Uh, Kent Brantley, who uh, was at Emory University, and he was one of those that had contracted Ebola in West Africa, when he was released from the hospital finally last week, he gave this tremendous testimony of what God had done in his life. And he went on and on about how thankful he was for his family, but how thankful he was to God. That God had, had deigned it, it good to restore him to his family and to his work. And he was actually thanking God even for his illness. I don't know if you heard his, his uh, report, but he actually even thanked God that he got the disease because he was able to be 
experimented on in a sense and, and hopefully what happened to him would result in therapies and things that could be done in West Africa to help all those that are now suffering from Ebola. He was even thankful for his disease. That's how thankful to God he was that he could be used. That is a mind that has been transformed by the work of the Holy Spirit. Now, in stark contrast to Dr. Brantley's obvious faith, his obvious renewal of the mind of God, there was a tweet that came in minutes after his speech to the media. This tweet came in, and this is what the tweet said. Yeah, you keep thanking God for saving you, a white man, while he lets thousands of blacks die of this terrible disease. What kind of God is that? See? No, no renewal there. I'd love to have tweeted back. When are you headed? When are you leaving for uh, Liberia? You know, when do you intend to leave for Liberia? Or Guinea? Or some of these places? It's amazing how those who get it, get it. Because of the work of the Holy Spirit in their life. And finally he says, that by testing, you may discern what is the will of God. And what does he mean by testing here? I think he means that by starting to live differently in the world. If you start living differently in the world, you're going to be tested. If you decide as a doctor, you're going to go into an extremely dangerous, uh, infected place to work, what have you just done? Something very dangerous. You've lived very differently in the world. There are a lot of doctors who wouldn't even think about doing that. But you have done it. All of a sudden you will find that uh, that the will of God is being carried out in your life and that you want to do more and more functioning in a way in this world that you are enhancing God's will in the world. Dr. Brantley is a good example of that. He didn't have to go to West Africa with Samaritan's Purse and work among highly infectious people. He did not have to do that. Our doctor that was working in India did not have to go into the hospital and lay his hands on 50 people with dengue fever and pray for them and then the next week get dengue fever himself. He didn't have to do that. But they have decided they're going to live differently in this world. They're going to engage in this world in the way that Jesus Christ would do. That's the transformed mind. And he says, finally, it will show you what is the good and acceptable and perfect will of God. What is the will of God? You will be tested to discern His will, and you will know that His will is good and acceptable and perfect. The word for perfect there is really a word which means complete, finished. It will show you what is good. He will teach you. He will teach you how to think what is good. He'll show you how to be acceptable to Him. The sacrifices of praise and thanksgiving in your life. He will show you those sacrifices that are acceptable. As the author of the book of Hebrews writes in Hebrews 13, 16, Do not forget to do good and to share with others. For with such sacrifices, God is pleased. He will reveal to you what is perfect. That ending time, that, that time of how you finish your life well. Jesus said on the cross, it is finished. His perfect work of salvation was done. Now you have been called to become a living sacrifice, perfecting in your life the things that God has called you to do. In Christ, when you have been transformed from uh, uh, and begin to live differently, you're living according to Ephesians chapter 2, verse 10, for you are God's workmanship created in Christ Jesus to do the works which God prepared beforehand you should do. There are a whole host of things God has prepared for you to do. And when you have that renewed mind, a renewed life, you do them because they are what God has called you to do. When you do this, then you reach the perfection. You reach the perfection that we have been called to. As St. Paul writes in Ephesians uh, chapter 4, you were taught with regard to your former way of life to put off your old self, which is being corrupted by its deceitful desires. That's, that's body stuff. To be made new in the attitude of your minds and to put on the new self that is body, soul, and spirit created to be like God in true righteousness and holiness. That's what we've been called to. That's the new different life that we've been called to lead. And this is what God is asking you to do today. He's asking you to declutter your life. Just as you might declutter your physical environment, declutter your spiritual life. 
Think about how we, by the Holy Spirit, might be enabled to declutter our minds and our hearts, our affections. If you will, if you will, and in your will, dis discern that you want to follow God wholly and completely, totally to a perfect end, then you will be transformed, as Paul says to Timothy in 2 Timothy 1.9, He has saved us and called us to a holy life. He saved us and called us to a holy life. And Paul says in Philippians 3, 12 and following, he says, not that, I've already, not that I have already uh, obtained all this or have already been made perfect, but I press on to take hold of that for which Christ Jesus took hold of me. And brothers, I do not consider myself yet to have taken hold of it. But one thing I do, forgetting what is behind, I strain towards what is ahead. And I press on towards the goal to which God has called me heavenward in Christ Jesus. That became his attitude, how he was going to live in Philippians there, chapter 3. And then in Romans 12, 3 through 8, he gives you then the litany of the gifts, the way you're supposed to live now as living sacrifices. You've been gifted to be a living sacrifice. He talks about the gift of teaching and exhorting and leading. He talks about that. Our, our leadership here at the church has said, are you ready to step up? Are you ready to step up here? Take those gifts that God has given you and begin to lead in this church. Begin to have a, a role in, in the work of this church that expands out into the world. Can you imagine the families we're going to reach through the, through the preschool? What we're going to be able to do here because of the gifts that God has gifted each of us with. And that we can put those gifts to use in the kingdom as living sacrifices which are temples of God. This is the life that is lived differently, my friend. This is the life of the living sacrifice to which you've been called. It is the life of those who have been transformed by the working of the Holy Spirit in mind, who give the reasoned worship, spiritual worship of their life to the living God, their total life, by their particular calling, and you have a particular calling in the Holy Spirit. Discerning the will of God, what is good and acceptable to Him, like Dr. Brantley and others who are sacrificing themselves according to the gifts which God has given, even those who are now still suffering in Liberia. Such are those who become an important and gracious part of the body of Christ. And that's what he says, though, each of you, each of you, are part of the body of Christ. And each of you have your calling in that. Just as not each part is the same, so it is in the church. But you're all part of that one body of Christ called to spiritual worship, which is acceptable to God. It is precisely at this point where your gift meets service, where your gift is lived out in the community of faith. Precisely at that point, you are offering your reasonable service, your spiritual worship to God. Amen. Let that peace of God, therefore, that passes our human understanding, keep our hearts and minds in Christ Jesus to life everlasting. Amen.